began to enjoy the drive and subsequently over speed. And all of a sudden, there was a sound from behind. And he recognized that it was the traffic police asking him to pull aside. So he pulled aside, the traffic man came to do the normal ritual and discovered it was the poop that was on the steering. So he called his boss in the city of Rome and said, listen, I found somebody here who has committed a traffic offense, but I really don't know what to do. And his boss said, of course you know what to do. Give him a ticket. And he said, well, it's not as easy as that. And he said, well, is it the mayor of Rome? He said, no, 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 it's not the mayor. So is it the prime minister? He said, no, it's not the prime minister. So who is it you can't give a ticket to? He said, well, I think the passenger in this car must be God because the coach is the driver. <laughs> the coach is the driver. The coach is the driver. The coach is the driver. The passenger must be God. I let me thank this eminence and thank one of you. But my there are copies of my lecture that you will get. It's a slightly longer version, and I normally do that one so that the conversation can continue. But I start from January 20th, 2017, which as all of you know was the day that Donald Trump was sworn in as president of the United States of America, and I will say no more than that. But I think that that ceremony itself is a metaphor for democracy. In part, because if you watched it, you saw against the background the draping flag of the United States of America, exhibiting very clearly the seamless bond between faith and patriotism. Because against the backdrop of that flag, the President of the United States of America raises his right hand, swears by the Bible, and pledges to govern the people of America. In that single moment, I think that what we see is a pulsating vitality, a significant moment that merges the past, the present, and the future into one very special moment. But contrast that with the 20th of January 2017 in the Gambia, where the president, newly elected president of Gambia had an opportunity to share a moment of history with the President of the United States of America. But as you know, the President-elect was sworn somewhere else because the President on the ground had decided to do what African Presidents do, namely decide it's not time to go. Now, I make this point because I think that against the backdrop of this situation, we know that for good or for bad, no matter what you say or think about Donald Trump, he is, according to the records, the 45th president of the United States of America. Now, and I find this very interesting, and I think it should be a subject for political science students and professors. Because in our own situation in Nigeria, we have no way of numbering our presidents. We have had prime minister, we've had a prime minister, we've had a head of we've had heads of state, we've had president. We've had a military president, one who ran the country. We also have had something unknown in democracy, namely the head of an interim government. Some like General Obasanjo and General Buhari have governed as military men. And proudly and happily have returned to accomplish as Democrats what they couldn't accomplish as military dictators. Please don't forget, both General Gowan and General Babangida have each tried to become president, but they didn't manage to get off the ground. General Abdesalam is still very strong. We don't know what he might decide to do. So after over 40, 50 years, the history of Nigeria's democracy has been a history of the size and the ambitions of the men in military uniform. In Nigeria, it is possible to earn retirement benefits as a military general, as a former head of state, as a democratically elected president. You pick your choice. Within the Senate, 
for the Federal Republic of Nigeria, which has become the retirement place for all former governors. One single Nigerian can earn retirement benefits as a former permanent secretary, a former civil servant, a former minister, a former governor, also a former senator. And all he or she can do is go all the way, depending on the size of their ambition. Students of political history, therefore, must find Nigeria very interesting. For example, we have no common nomenclature for determining those who have governed Nigeria. So we cannot number our presidents the way Amana and America has done. Because we cannot number the prime minister, we had only one. But we also had President Namdi Azikiwe, we also had President Jonathan, we also have, have had President, Gen President General Ibrahim Babangida, all three claiming names of presidents, but in different contexts and in different ideological circumstances. Such is our state of confusion that even in the picture gallery of our former presidents, we are the only ones in the world that have men serving and showing different colors in one gallery. In one moment, General Buhari appears as a former general. Another moment, he appears as Nigeria's president in Abada. In one moment, Obasanjo appears as a general. Another, he appears in Abada as the president of Nigeria. Well, we can go on and on. I'm only waiting your appetite to state the nature, the context, and the content of the confusion for Nigeria. Now, I've decided to title this lecture, Go Tribe and Tongue May Differ. And as all of us here already know, this is one of the stanzas of the first national anthem. Many of us probably don't know that our first national anthem was written by a British woman known as Miss Lillian Jean Williams, also a second British woman who actually composed the music, Francis Breda, ahead of our independence in 1960. When we add that to the fact that this name, Nigeria, was given to us by a British woman, we must be grateful to British women. <laughs> now, we sang this anthem up to 1978 when the military, for some inexplicable reason, decided that we'll have to change our national anthem. Now, I need to make the point that national anthems are the highest expressions of the collective aspiration vision and dreams of most nations because they summon a nation to some form of secular worship the words stare and strike a chord of patriotism in all citizens the wordings of national anthems oh my goodness this man now has covered my paper <laughs> the wordings of national anthems are often set against the backdrop of battle in which a nation seeks God's intervention in vanquishing an enemy. The lines of national anthems are often set in a tone of prayers. And I had to go through a few national anthems. And they contain fears, they also contain hopes and aspirations of nations. The words often ring out summoning an entire people to a triumphant parade of patriotism and sacrifice. Almost all anthems I reviewed appeal to God for victory, and life seems to be cast as a battle. And I will illustrate this point. First, the British anthem, titled God Save the Queen, is set against the backdrop of the monarchy, and it says in one of the stanzas, O oh Lord our God, arise, scatter our enemies, and make them fall, confound their politics, frustrate their nervous tricks. On thee, our hope we fix. God save the queen. God save us all. End of quote. The anthem of the United States of America is titled The Star Spangled Banner. It was written in 1814 by one Francis Scott Key. He records the same sentiments because he pitches the country against an imaginary enemy of self and prays for victory. One of the stanzas says, their blood has wiped out their foul food, footsteps pollution. No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. And the star-spangled banner in triumph that wave over the land of the free 
and the home of the brave. Freedom and bravery have always been common metaphors in American history. The South African National Anthem in Kosi Sikeke, Africa, which I believe many of us know, God bless Africa, is an expression of the philosophy of that country. It says, namely, welding together an amalgam of groups, cultures, and faith. And the South African National Anthem is perhaps spectacular because it is the only anthem in the world that mixes words from different tribes to acknowledge its diversity. There are words from Kosa, Zulu, Sesotho, Africans, and English in keeping with the hopes of that country towards building what they call a rainbow nation. But one stanza says, protect the nation by stopping wars and sufferings. In other countries, almost every citizen from the cradle can sing their national anthem. And I want to thank the young ladies in the choir who sang the national anthem because for many of us in Nigeria, left on our own devices, even a gathering of the Federal Executive Council will be unable to sing the national, recite the national anthem. But the British still cling to their anthem, and also what is important is in my check, couldn't find any country, and there may be, and there should be, maybe, but I didn't find any country that had had to change its anthem, except Nigeria. The British anthem was composed in 1745. The Indians still sing their anthem. The Yanagana, composed by their favorite son Tagore, who earned the Nobel Prize in 1913. The anthem itself was composed in 1911. And the Indians still sing it. And part of the world celebrate the pluralism that is characteristic of India. They celebrate the Himalayas, the Ganges, and some of them as witnesses. And the anthem acknowledges, among other things, in quote, that the salvation of all people is in God's hands, thou dispenser of India's destiny. End of quote. Now, if I ask all of us who are here to, for example, and I will give you for this one naira if you answer correctly. <laughs> okay, let me say one dollar. If I ask all of us, uh, what, uh, what do the following people have in common? General Obasanjo, General Buhari, General Babangida, and General Bowen. No need guessing. We were all from a heads of state. If I ask you, what do Mwanko Kamu, Daniel Amokachi, Sam Sincere, Sia, Taribo West, what do they have in common? All of us will say they played for the Super Eagles. But now, this is the $1 million one. Please, if I ask you, what do John in the Chuku, M. Etim Akpan, B. A. Ogonaike, Sota Omoigi, and P. O. Aderibe. What do they have in common? Again, I will save you. Thank you. They are Nigerians. That's all we know about them. That's all we know about them. But incidentally, the national anthem that we just sung was put together by these four people. Now, it is also is a measure of the quality of our patriotism because I again, if I take this, what I've just said to the Senate or to the House of Representatives or to the Federal Executive Council, I'm not sure I will get an answer. And if I ask, what does any Nigerian remember about one Benedict or Diaz? Many of us might say, oh dear, say, oh dear, say, the name sounds like, be like Sena Edo name. <laughs> That's all we can say. But Peter Odiase was the man who set these words into music in 1978 and conducted the police band that sang our second national anthem. Now, I have said, I've, I've gone taking you through all this. Because by 1978, for some reason that nobody can explain, but we can assume that General Obasanjo are members of the Armed Forces or Supreme Military Council, even we have no agreement as to whether the Armed Forces Ruling Council or Supreme Military Council, whatever. But when they decided to change this anthem, we are to assume that they thought it was time for Nigeria to turn a new page. But again, little editorial differences because by the time 
that this British lady wrote her first anthem, Nigeria was a motherland. By the time Nigerian men wrote the anthem, motherland had become fatherland. <laughs> now, perhaps, as I say, the leaders who do what they did have an idea. Now, I want to therefore go back to raise the issue of why did I choose this topic? Do tribe and tongue may differ. It's because I think that managing diversity has become so critical and that the reason why Nigeria is failing is largely because of the inability of those who govern Nigeria, and I'm not talking of president and governors, I'm talking about all of those who, go, who, man, who govern Nigeria, whether as bishops, whether as deans or faculties, whether as vice chancellor, whether as cooks or head cooks, all of us find difficulty in managing diversity. And my argument is that diversity, which has become a liability in Nigeria, is actually an asset, and it is of God. Therefore, the question that I think we then need to ask is how did diversity, how did tribe and tongue become weapons of war as they have become now? And to that extent, I just divide the paper into four different sections. I'll run through them briefly. Now, the first thing I try to say is that in what I call the road not taking, and that part of the reason why we are where we are now is because we didn't take the road that we should have taken. In whatever shape or form, and I borrow from the words of Robert Frost, who died in 1963. Many of you may know of him. He's an American poet. He has a poem of his titled, The Road Not Taken. And he says, those of you who teach English, please, I don't, I'm not a teacher of poetry, so pardon, but I'll read through, because I think it's so significant. He says, he goes to us, two roads diverge on a yellow wood. I'm sorry, I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair. And haven't perhaps a better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the person there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no one had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. End of quote. This poem has been subjected to different interpretations. The lessons of the poem are very many and they are complex. But I think no one has had the opportunity right up to the end of where we are now in Nigeria. My argument is that there are very few, and I can't think of many Nigerian leaders that have had to take the decision of taking the road less travel. Frost seems says that this will be a long journey because what he says, he speaks to all of us. Again, Frost is honest to know that, as they say, you do not cross one river twice. And then that doesn't strike twice in one place. So Frost admits that much as he might dream, there is no guarantee that he will come back to the same road again. He summons history, knowing that his judgment would happen long after he and his choices may have gone. So yes, he took a risk and was ready to live with the consequences. It was a decision based on courage, courage built on hope, and hope that had faith at its foundation. So it is not so much what history remembers us of, but for him, what is most important is that he took a decision and that he took a turn. Now, what does this say to us in Nigeria today? Quite a lot of things, and some of them I mentioned in the paper. Now, my argument is that today our youth face an uncertain future. One that is marked by the debris of broken dreams, journeys started and not completed, either uncompleted or disrupted, 
We often fear to do something new because it has never been done before. The real reason why we stagnate as a nation is because we tend to say this is how it has always been done. Our ancestors did it this way. In the name of culture, our development has continued to stagnate. Our country is, is a regression. And in the name of cultural preservation, we are wearing beads that we do not produce, turbans that we do not weave, and we are pouring libation with cheap wine that we do not produce. It must be of us. It must be of our nation. It must be of us that Gibran, the Lebanese writer, says, and I quote, Pity that nation that wears a cloth that it does not weave. Pity that nation that eats bread it does not harvest. Pity that nation that drinks a wine that flows not from its own wine first. End of quote. So the next question is, how did tribe come to matter? Often you hear Nigerians boast either of themselves or of their friends, especially at elections. We should elect this man because he's a vitrabalized Nigeria. It's a word that has never been subjected to interrogation. But a vitrabalized Nigerian is supposed to be a Nigerian who is blind to tribe. But my argument, tested by my own little experience, is that even arm robbers can be vitrabalized. <laughs> and that the reality is that people measure vitrabalization by the scope of the social cycle of their friends, co-conspirators, and so on and so forth. And so I make the point therefore that it is not so much a question of ethnicity or ethnic or tribal differences being a liability. Indeed, for those of us who are Christians and have read the Bible, or Muslims, anybody who has read the Bible, the perfect example, the story of the brother, two brothers, Cain and Eber, that arrived at the beginning of the Bible. They were children of the same parents, so they spoke the same language, but one killed the other. The point I'm making therefore is that there's nothing to suggest that there is a correlation between ethnic homogeneity and justice. So for example, it might be fair to say that the British did, did their best and they left behind a bureaucracy that could have delivered the kind of services that we needed. They laid a foundation for a, a pretty sound educational and economic base amidst the fears and anxieties, at least of the minorities, both in the Middle Belt and in the South, the British were imaginative enough to set up in 1958 the Willing Commission to listen to the fear and the anxieties of ordinary people who felt threatened, dwarfed, intimidated by the dominant ethnic groups. I don't want to go into the details, but in his wisdom, the Premier of Northern Nigeria, Amadou Bello, Sir Amadou Bello, also was wise enough to send out in 1958, just before independence, a delegation of Muslims and one Christian to go around some of the places like Sudan, Pakistan and other places to find out how are other countries managing to live with Islamic law? What are the consequences? What are the implications for democracy, for diversity and so on? And here I remember the story of a young Nigerian who was to be on a similar delegation to go and find out about how Sharia law is applied in other places. So he went to his father and said, Baba, government has given me opportunity to travel out of the country. And the father said, to do what? He said, oh, we are going to see how Sharia law is being applied. And his father said to him, uh-uh. I have been teaching, am I not the one who taught you the Quran? He said, yes, you are. I have been teaching Quran for over 50 years. Why do you have to travel abroad? We are here. The man looked at his father and said, Papa, this Nigerian Quran doesn't have a star code. And so, <laughs> the local Nigerian Quran doesn't have a star code. So, our problem has never really been about identifying best practices elsewhere. It is to square the science to ask the question, how is it that best practices elsewhere? Because Nigeria like to photocopy. We don't have time, attention, and energy for details. So we like to photocopy. And we think, and we hear, oh, it's working in China, it's working in 
Singapore is working, you can count and it rolls into hundreds of millions of trips made by civil servants traveling the globe to find out how things are done. And then no sooner do people come back. In fact, as an aside, a gentleman told me a story. He was part of a delegation. And the federal government delegation it was to negotiate a deal with the Chinese somewhere. I think in Washington or so. So he said the man who was leader of their delegation was about 70 something years old. Because when they are setting up these committees, it's all for patronage. Nothing wrong with 70, your eminence. I know you are 70. <laughs> so he said, when they go to the hotel where they were staying, he said he was just walking past. And he found that the Chinese had gathered somewhere and they were doing yoga and psyching themselves up, preparing for this meeting to gain psychological advantage. The man who told me the story is there, I can <laughs> he was part of the delegation. He said when he saw this, he rushed to the hotel room of the chairman and leader of the delegation to tell him what was happening and how they needed to prepare. He said when he opened the door, he knocked, opened the door, saw chairman sitting, one young girl on the left lap, another young girl on the right lap, and a bottle of champagne in between. That was how Nigeria was preparing for this negotiation. Now, can I get a water, please? Now, imperfect as it may be, I think that the critical question we must therefore try and deal with is the fact that we must ask how the things begin to go wrong in Nigeria. And for me, I'm pleased, I may be 100% wrong, but I'm convinced that we must return to the scene of the crime. And the first thing that happened was our decision to create states. No matter how noble the intentions may have been, but let us remember that the creation of states, the evidence is there, historical, the historical records are there, and the key actors are still alive. States were not created because it was considered to be the best platform for development, or strategy for development. The creation of states was almost like an emergency decision to stop Ojuku from going to war and rebellion. That is, I mean, those are the facts. They are subjected to interpretation. Therefore, notwithstanding the fact that we had the coups in 1966, and notwithstanding what happened in 1967, I am convinced that we could still have, if we made the right choice, had different outcomes. But what happened then from the first military coup was a systematic diminution of politics and politicians. The military adopting scaremongering tactics and presenting some of the best brains in this nation and patriotic citizens who were in politics and understood the complexity of this country. They also understood politics as service. Those of them who survived, the unfortunate ones like Tafa Balewa and Samado Bello, and a good number of them who lost their lives, were presented in a different light. People like Obafami Awolowo, Nambi Azikiwe, Sami Koku, Bola Ige, Sam Bakwe, Abuba Karimi, Solomon La, a galaxy of politicians that could have changed the nature of politics in this country. Suddenly, by way of imprisonment, intimidation, blackmail, detention, we ended up with a situation in which politics became a dangerous game. And it then became a platform only for those who had the ability and the capacity for thuggery and other forms of enforcement. But even more dangerously, when the politics become a, you know, became a connivance between the political elite and their succeeding contractors. So those who made money from the military <clears throat> with almost absolutely no belief in anything. They were ready to make money under the military. And if politics became available, they went into politics. And if the military came, they went back to business. This contractual arrangement had a deforming effect on Nigeria because the price that we then paid was that increasingly Nigerians became aware of certain forms of identity. And whereas the military, with a legitimate right to monopoly of violence, turned that violence on the citizens of Nigeria, 
Leadership then became unpredictable because you could never tell who would be president or who would be head of state. And you could never tell when the next coup was going to happen. And please, if you have the time, go back and read the speeches of all the coup plotters from 1966 until the last coup. And what you will feel is a sense of shame. Because you ask yourself, how could people have written this kind of terribly bad English? But most importantly, you show evidence of warped minds that were ill-prepared. And this is why every time a coup was staged, you will always hear the soldiers saying, please stay by your radios and wait for the next instruction. Evidence, preparation had never been done. Now, there is, there is also then, of course, as I said, my argument is that as the political space was opening up, with government creating more states and more local government areas, new identities began to emerge. The most unfortunate thing, of course, is that states were no longer created based on any scientific analysis. We didn't even have the ethnographical discipline of the British, because the British spent years looking at the various ethnic configurations and cultural configurations and even economic. So when they created the provinces, they were not for nothing. I stand to be corrected by students of political science and history. But there are very few, and I don't know any, countries in Asia and Africa that went through British colonialism that have states. Most countries from Ghana, South Africa, and others have still maintained the boundaries that were created. They've been subjected to different forms of administration. But many of them are still largely left intact. The result then is that there has been relative peace and stability to some level. But also, people have been able to manage diversity and also manage economic programs in ways and manner that people are able to compete, but they are all within the same country. What we had in Nigeria is a systematic fragmentation and an, an exponential rise in identity consciousness. Because every time a new cell was created, people broke into celebration because they were celebrating independence. If a new local government area was created, people broke into celebration because they were celebrating independence. And their brothers and sisters and cousins and nephews of yesterday suddenly become enemies. They become oppressors. And we have stories, no sooner has states been created than brothers and sisters living together, people were removed from the civil service, people were told to pack and go home immediately. And of course, as citizens moved under these circumstances, increasingly there was bitterness, increasingly there was a sense of assumption that I was wrong to assume that I was a northerner. I was wrong to assume. That. And it, all you need to do is to hear stories, for example, of the people of Jigawa after the creation of, I mean, of Jigawa from Kano State, or the people of Abia, or the people of Kabul, any state you go to in Nigeria, you will find that people began to tell stories and became conscious of a level of oppression that those of you looking and those of us who are merely looking could never have imagined. Now, over the years, the culture of the, of the establishment of federal and state universities has not cured our problem. In a lecture which I delivered, in the convocation lecture I delivered in the University of Oyo titled To Heal a Fractured Nation in 2014, I argue, and I'm still persuaded, but I may be wrong, that indeed, <clears throat> when the federal government decided to name University, when we had University of Ibadan, University of Nigeria and Suka, Madubele University, University of Calabar, Lagos, Port Harcourt, among others, which were theaters of academic excellence. Now, they attracted some of the best brands around the world. And I pointed out in that lecture that I thought it was a great mistake for the federal government to name a university in Kano after Adobe Bayero, a university in Ife after Awolowo, a university in Sokoto after Osuman Danfodio, a university in Nsuka, I mean in Oka after Obafami, I mean after Namdi Azikiwe. My argument is that what the government has inadvertently done is to reinforce a feeling of exclusion. The result now is that you can ask the question, although Osuman Danfodio University is a federal university, is it possible that a Christian can be vice-chancellor? 
or Namdi Azikiwa University is in Oka. Is it possible for a Muslim to become a vice chancellor? These are the rather shameful questions that we are compelled to ask. The result then is that you have in some states a domestication of institutions funded by our collective commonwealth. But culturally, those institutions are now being presented as if they are cultural forms of those localities. And so in places like Bayero University, where, for example, three years or four years ago, 25 Catholic professors and senior lecturers and students were slaughtered in one hall on Sunday while they were worshipping. Because 40 years after the settlement of the university, the authorities don't believe that Christians should have a place of worship. It's not different from Usman Danfodo University and a good number of other universities. Whether it is about mosque or about church, the issue is that there is a certain kind of identity consciousness that has turned our differences into instruments of psychological and physical violence. The result then is that the construction of a new nation the construction of a new nation remains largely a defined dream. Now, the final mistake that I still think we made is in the bureaucracy. Today, many people in the bureaucracy, if you are permanent secretary, if you are minister, that you are director and you retired, nobody is measuring your performance by what you did for Nigeria. You measure performance by how many of your people you brought into the civil service. If you are chief of army staff or chief of law staff, or if you are a minister, Nigerians are not concerned about what happens. If I shall not like, let him not give us power. As long as your bars get contracts, as long as your bars get employed. If Siri can like, make play no fly. As long as people from Katsina or Dora, wherever it comes from, are employed. So we are no longer measuring performance based on what this nation wants, but we are measuring performance by local and ethnic considerations. And this is why we have this shameful attitude in which, for example, most who is a man appointed a minister, then he becomes a title holder. And so you may be a minister in the Federal Republic of Nigeria, when you go back to your village, you that can shake the president of Nigeria cannot shake a traditional ruler. Because you are now lying on the ground, you cannot sit on a chair. So you are a minister in Abuja, but a subject back in this locality. So these are some of the distortions and contradictions that have distorted our sense of nationhood, our sense of unity. And so I therefore make the point that the reason why we are having problems, we cannot agree. We all hear about the fight against corruption and we love it. But it doesn't matter to me that I have been misrepresented. I still insist. And I'm proud to say that on this matter of corruption, I am one of the first members of the Transparency International in Nigeria. One of the first members. Okay? The other members were President Obasanjo, don't mind what you think of him, obviously personally, General Williams, myself, and I don't, I don't remember the others. So when we talk about corruption, please let us be clear. We are the realm of science. We are the realm of science. This is not, this is not, it's not about good intentions. And I have argued that we should not be talking of fighting corruption because corruption is not necessarily a battle. It is not necessarily a battle. Now, the president of the Philippines, President uh, Duterte, is insulted the Catholic Church. Why? Because the Catholic Church says to him, you cannot fight drugs in this way. Actually, he has now admitted that he is almost dying, and I think he has a drug-related or smoking problem himself. But he decided he has killed thousands of his own fellow countrymen. And it's very interesting. People and people started celebrating that the man is getting rid of drugs. But then, two weeks ago, I stumbled on an article in the New York Times, written by President Oscar, the former president of um, what do you call this country, Colombia. And as you know, 
Colombia, they were the headquarters of drugs. It still probably still is. And President Oscar prides himself with being the only one who was able to arrest Pablo Escobar, the biggest drug baron in the world. But in the New York Times article, the president said to Duterte, he said, you cannot win a war against drugs because drugs are a social problem. It's a distinction, classical distinction. So treatment is not the issue. If you are suffering from leprosy, it's not about the Vaseline you apply. It is that Vaseline can make your leprosy. So my argument then as now has always been that what we call corruption is really another name for injustice, for poverty, for impunity, for might is right, purely and simply another name for a country that has lost its moral compass to the point that the issue of what is right and what is wrong now in Nigeria is almost impossible to define. It's not a sociological category, it's not a theological category. And I'll give you a simple example. If you ask the question now, if I want to work in Central Bank, what should I do? Nobody will tell you, I don't know. If you have a first class, where can you work? It depends. If you want to get admission in the university, what should you do? It depends. If you want to join the army, they say they have advertised. They say, it depends. They say, I suffered the exam and I passed. But getting in, it all depends. And when a nation has lost its moral compass, the truth of the matter is that all of us, including myself, we must ask the question, how and why do we become so comfortable with the stench of what we call corruption? And our inability to rally around and agree on a common vocabulary as to what constitutes corruption is at the heart of the problem. So today, you know, we, as we know, the election, I was telling uh, uh, Professor Antonia, I said, I'm very happy that INEC has expanded, you know, the, the, the adjectives. And what do you expect of our election? In 2015, it was wanted free and fair and credible election. Now the vocabulary is longer. <laughs> but as you know, the only election that was transparent and honest is the one my brother won. It doesn't matter how many corpses he walked through to win. The only election that was not transparent is the one that our, the person who defeated our brother won. So we have no agreement, and unless we come to terms, and this lack of agreement is also based on a nation that has fragmented tongues and speaking different languages and is in, in, in interpreting the constitution differently. So, by way of conclusion, let me now come back to the point. I stopped on something very interesting. I was just tumbling, I was just going through the computer. I found something. The 10 best leaders in Africa. And then the 10 worst leaders in Africa. And the 10 most educated leaders in Africa. And the 10 least educated leaders in Africa. And guess what? Nigeria was not in any of them. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure whether to be happy or not. But <laughs> Thank you. Nigeria was not in any of them. But what does this tell us? It also tells us that we must ask ourselves, how is it that we have a country where almost everybody who has become a president has become a president by accident? <laughs> president Buhari is president of Nigeria today, but he had told us he no longer wanted to be president. He no manufactured. He said he was no longer going to compete for elections. He took over from uh, good Lord Jonathan, who was minding his business as governor, and then they came and brought him. He was in <laughs> professor of zoology, probably was thinking of finishing being governor, starting maybe a fishery farm, whatever, we don't know. <laughs> but he was brought and became, and this is where he took over from Yaradwa. Yaradwa had already concluded with Amadou Bene University. He was going back to teach chemistry or so. Do you want to be president? 
They dragged him. There are the to come out from Obasanjo. Obasanjo was in his farm. They dragged him to do one thing. He said he did a second thing. I said he was more than now. Now, Obasanjo took over from General Abdul Salam. And as you know, General Abdul Salam, decent gentleman, but his name was already on Nabacha's list for retirement. <laughs> Just because Abacha died. So maybe they may have whispered to him that it was time to go, but he came and hurriedly put whatever he could and had the decency to step aside. But he took over from Abacha. Abacha took over from Shonekon. Shonekon was thinking of what to do with his big company. He said, Come and be head of interim government or head of government, whichever we don't know, but that's where we are. So they're going to go now from Babangira. Please, Babangira told us, go back and read the speech. He said he was stepping aside, not that he was tired or going away. So, and we can go on and on. It is a question of how have we ended with parachuted leadership. We don't know. We just wake up and somebody just goes and it's... So if we are looking for how we have ended up where we are, we must look well. I, I think I'm almost... I have a classmate. I have a classmate of mine was my classmate at Harvard. He's a young man, young American, and he's convinced that he'll be president of America. And he has, I can see the trajectory of his. He served, I mean, I don't want to tell you the full story, but what is interesting about the young man, he served as chief of staff to a governor, I won't call his name, in the, in the United States, and then from there, the, the brother of the governor became the president of America, and he got a job at, the big job in America, used the influence of the family. Then he went, he's done all kinds of but he's marking now he has decided to go and start a finance company. Because he says, I want to understand how the economy works. When Obama went to Harvard, Obama knew he had ambitions, but I don't think he expected to be where he was, but he planned. And that was why he worked so hard to become editor of the Harvard Law. Journal. But more importantly, in part of his study, he said he undertook a course on the market. The point I'm making is leadership can never be by accident. And the consequences of what we have suffered must be located in the long culture and history of military rule and military interventions in our country over the last years. So, again, how do we remedy these situations? Diversity is an asset. And managing diversity is a cause. Business schools teach managing diversity as a cause. Because you have to ask yourself. I remember one day, you know, I'd be sure to Cardinal Nathan likes to talk about the fact that he's taller than me, which is fine. But like I said, whether it's himself or President Buhari, the only advantage they have over me is that they can change a bulb. And I may not be able to, but I can hire somebody to change a bulb for me. But I'd be sure to and my, I'm taller than I used to You know, and when I met Mother Teresa, I discovered I was so happy. When I met Mother Teresa, she reached me here. She was looking at me like this. But we, we, had, we met at the conference with Abishal Tutu. He said, ah, I like your presentation. Let's take a picture. So we stood to take a picture. When we were about to take the picture, they were adjusting the camera. When Cardinal's friend, John uh, Waligo, your friend in Uganda, who was blacker than me, so he came to join the picture. So Abishal Tutu said, wait, wait, wait. So John came. When John came, Abishal Tutu discovered he was lighter than me, but I was lighter than the Waligo. So as the cameraman was adjusting his camera, Abishal Tutu saw one white man come. He said, come, come, come and I'll call it to our photograph. Come, come and I'll call it to our <laughs> The question is, is it possible for an institution to recognize that we need people to add color and if that is the case, then we must make sure that institutionally we ask ourselves, where are the people with disability? Where are the blind? Where are the lame? I was very, it was very interesting. Two days ago, I read a very interesting story. My friend in uh, Sheikh Usami, the senator from Kaduna State, who decided to bring some cripples and lepers into his office in the National Assembly. And the leper said, ah, this is the first time Lepa will enter National Assembly. <laughs> I, 
And that was a very spectacular. But the point is, are we running an inclusive system? Because if we are not, and one of the things you discover with some of the most powerful institutions in the world today is how they have managed diversity. If you go to Harvard, people give you the impression that you must be exceptionally brilliant. And those who are there are imagine that they are also, it's not true, it's a lie. Well, it's not a lie, but it's not the whole truth. But Harvard goes out of its way to diversify. Right now, as I'm talking to you, next week, the director of admissions from Harvard is coming to Nigeria to sell. But the point I'm making is they are deliberate in making sure that if they have to, if they have two first class students who have applied, three of them from Nigeria, and they have a place for only two people, and another one has applied from Eritrea, they might take the person from Eritrea because they say we have had enough Nigerians who want to hear about Eritrea. So a situation where, and I've said it to people who are in the security agencies when I've had the chance to speak to them. I say, if we are serious, if we are serious, as I said, all the security agencies in this country, you must figure out how to manage diversity, which means that it must be your policy that you have almost everybody from every tribe in Nigeria, especially the security agencies. Otherwise, if you don't have the quality of listening devices that you can use, You'll find out yourself unable to deal with issues of conflict and crisis. So, although we have the platforms such as the National Human Rights Commission, Public Complaints Commission, National Legal Aid Council, all these bodies are important. But to create equality, we must resort to advocacy. And the quality of the men and women who are at the Supreme Court of Nigeria, or any country for that matter, determine whether a country can live by the letter and the spirit of the law that are in the constitution. Because we have constitutions that read like the Bible, but they are unable to deliver, because by themselves, they cannot self-propel themselves. If you look at the United States of America, we would never have had an Obama had it not been for the historic Supreme Court judgment of 1954, known as Brown versus Board of Education, which was the handiwork. It continued, but Start by with the great work done by liberals like John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. Beginning with the great work on the Civil Liberties Act that was signed into law in 1964. So we require in our country and in our society men and women from across the board because the lives of Martin Luther King, the lives of Malcolm X, the lives of Rosa, of, of, of Rosa Parks, people like Thurgood Marshall who changed the face of America and black America. Very little attention is paid to him. We focus on Martin Luther King, which is wonderful. But my favorite person has always been Togo Marshall. You don't need to be a lawyer. He opened the doors of opportunity for black people and decided to contest for issues of equality and kept banging until he became a member of the Supreme Court of America. So the point I'm making therefore, by way of conclusion, is that yes, though tribe and tongue may differ, creating an equal society is not impossible. And I want to conclude by quoting something from a book written by one of the very important archbishops of America, who, Fulton Sheen, who made the point that in life we have choices. And the choices are we either choose, we have to choose between a feast and a fast. It depends on which one comes first. You either feast now and fast tomorrow, or you fast now, and feast tomorrow. The argument, my conclusion is that Nigeria, when it faced the challenge, decided to feast. And we are still feasting. Because outside France, nobody consumes as much champagne as we do in Nigeria. Because international airlines survive by the route to Nigeria. And it is therefore impossible for us to answer the question. How is it that after 15 years, with rocket, science, rocket scientists, all kinds of scientists we have in our universities, after 15 years, we have only managed to generate 50, I mean 3,000 megawatts of electricity. After 15 years, this country still does not have a public highway that you can drive in confidence for 20 kilometers without fearing a pothole. After over 50 years, Nigeria is unable to supply its citizens with water. After over 50 years, 
Nigeria is still unable to provide its citizens with education. Yesterday, I was with the Minister of Agriculture, Audobe, one of the most brilliant people you'll ever meet. I don't know how he manages, but he has all incredible figures in his head. But he said, Nigerians have bought, Nigerian government, we bought 94 million mosquito nets. 94 million mosquito nets. And one old man said, and they said the calculation is one mosquito net for four people. They are not allowing for the, okay, a man, like some of my brothers now, a man with four wives and uh, 20 children, which of the wives will sleep under the net and which man will? But anyway, out of the same people came to him with another contract that they need some, another million, how many other million mosquito nets? He said, uh -uh, wait. This 94 million multiplied by four is more than our population. In any case, there were mosquitoes in Europe. Where have they gone to? They haven't migrated. Is that scientifically, Europeans figure out how to end mosquitoes. So I'm just making the point that it must be the point, that it must be the case, that the mobility of the university as an institution of research and direction for how and where a country should be headed for. That nobility must be restored. Now, a young lady, I read a newspaper in Daily Trust of February 15th, while I was writing this paper. The story of a young lady called Jane Park. She won the sum of one million pounds, which is the equivalent of 382 million naira, in 2013. Today, after barely three years, she says, and I quote, at times, I feel like winning the lottery has ruined my life. I thought it would make it 10 times better, but it has made it 10 times worse. I have material things, but apart from that, my life is empty. The question then, money is good, but what is it to be used for? Mahatma Gandhi had a friend, and the friend was taunting him. So he said to him, he said, Mahatma, if you saw two bags, one full of money and one bag full of wisdom, which one will you choose? Gandhi said, I will choose the bag full of money. And the man who knew Gandhi and his austere lifestyle, I knew that Gandhi didn't really need much money. He said to him, but I'm surprised, Gandhi, that you make that kind of a choice. Gandhi said to him, it's because the man said, if I were the one, I will pick the bag with money. And Gandhi looked at him and said, well, Everyone will have to choose that which he or she does not have. So, if you don't have wisdom, you have chosen wisdom. And so, I want to leave the graduates with something because Nigerian young people are moving into an uncertain future. We must seek the way of mending the fractures in our society. All our, all our religions and cultures teach us about the need to stand together in love. Life is hard in Nigeria, but we must surrender. We must never give up. And the fight against corruption must continue. My niece sent something to me that I think her boyfriend sent to her. He says, my darling, our love is like corruption in Africa. It will never end. <laughs> our love is like corruption in Africa. It will never, never end. I leave you with, you know, because we have to ask, where did all this start from? Because we know where we went wrong, where we took the wrong turn. But we can begin a journey back. But there were two friends who would spend the night drinking beer. And they woke up with terrible hangover. And there's a belief among people who drink that if you got a hangover from drinking star, go back and drink star, then it will cure. So they went to the to a, a pub and they were drinking. Then the man says, ah, oh boy, last night I woke up this morning, my head, I see they are pounding yam inside. So one madman was walking past. And then the second man says, you, my head, you know, as if. Then the madman, as he was saying, as if, the madman said, ah, oh that, like from here to here, he said to the madman, what do you mean? How do you know? He said, now some of my own start. <laughs> so, uh, well, let us know that
I want to leave the graduates with something that I found somewhere. And it says, please listen, let me end the quotation. I've taken most of your time. I've taken a lot of your time. But it says, it says, the title of it is, I don't remember where I got it, but the title of it is, it is in your hands. A tennis racket is useless in my hands. But a tennis racket in the hands of Miss Serena Williams is worth billions of naira. Remember, it depends on whose hands it is in. A rod in my hands, we keep an angry dog away. But a rod in the hands of Moses parted the Red Sea. It depends on whose hands it is in. A catapult in my hand is a toy. And in my marriage to kill a bird, but a catapult in the hand of David killed Goliath. Remember, it depends on whose hands it is in. Two fishes and five loaves of bread in my hands are just enough for breakfast. But in the hands of Jesus, it fed thousands. A certificate from the University of Abuja is a stepping stone to greatness. My dear young people, remember, it depends on whose hands it is in. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this is quintessential Kuka. If it is possible for the Vice Chancellor to bring him back next year, please, the Vice Chancellor. On behalf of staff and students of this university, kindly bring him back if it's possible. I know how difficult it is. Um, Father, thank you. Thank you for coming and thank you for the feast you have uh, uh, given to us. Uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge the presence of uh, a number of uh, other friends and uh, visitors uh, to this uh, university who have come to join us. The Vice Chancellor of Federal University, Kashere, uh, is represented by Professor M. D. Abdullahi. You are welcome. And the SUG President of the University of Abuja is also present. You are welcome. Professor Kabiru Bala, DBC Admin ABU, representing Vice Chancellor of ABU, Saria, you're welcome. Uh, Professor Stephen Honor, DG National Mathematical Center, you're welcome. <laughs> Deputy Commandant Paul Igwebike, Registrar uh, of uh, uh, Civil Defense Academy, you're welcome. Professor Victor uh, Peter Modi, uh, VC Delta State University, Abraka, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Nonyem Onyechi, Director of Planning and Policy and Analysis, uh, representing Executive Vice uh, Chairman, Nassen, Professor M.S. Harina, you're welcome, Madam. The Accountant General of the Federation, uh, represented by Dr. Bakan Wadinga, uh, uh, Director of Revenue and Return. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm happy we introduced the Accountant General's uh, representative so that uh, the funds will keep flowing. 
I understand the Vice Chancellor of uh, Jigawa State University is also in our midst. Please, can you rise for recognition? You're welcome. You're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, after that um, uh, enthralling lecture by Father Kukan, uh, I don't think there's any other thing we need to say here, honestly. Um, we hand over to okay, the plaque. The plaque will now be given to the, uh, the guest lecturer. Thank you so much. You can agree with me that you made the right choice. <laughs> Thank you. 